hymn of celebration is O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Please stand as you are able and join in the singing of hymn number 57. Christian Church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascendeth into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Throughout the, the history of the church, uh, there have always been symbols uh, that have been used in worship, uh, whether it be uh, the flame, whether it be the cross, or whether it be colors, they're all used to help aid us in our worship. And uh, periodically, from time to time, uh, they uh, run their course, and we replace them. And that's often done at the generosity of so many people who care about worship, who, who want to help all of us 
uh, as we worship together. And so this morning, uh, you've seen that we have a new green uh, pyramids in our worship, and we want to consecrate those. And uh, all throughout the history of the church as well, consecration is always done when people offer themselves in the form of prayer a- as an act of worship. And so we, we want to pray this morning for God to consecrate these uh, that we use now to aid us in our worship. And I want to invite you to, uh, to also do that. You'll notice on the back of your handout, there's a responsive prayer. I uh, want to direct your attention to that uh, and respond in, in the bold print. Keep in mind again that we are grateful uh, to the St. Paul Altar Guild uh, and to Louise Hardaway's grandchildren uh, in uh, providing uh, these new pyramids for us in honor of Sarah Hardaway Houston uh, and in memory of Louise Hardaway, Rebecca Hardaway King, and uh, Sarah McDuffie uh, Hardaway. Will you join me in prayer? O gracious God, our Father, we know that you delight in hearing the prayers and praise of your people. Thank you for the many gifts which help to proclaim your gospel, for language and poetry, for music and for art and architecture, each focusing our minds and our hearts on your marvelous grace in baptism, holy communion, and the proclamation of your word. You have given to your church throughout the world, throughout the world artisans who create fine and beautiful things which inspire our worship and glorify your name. For all who use these gifts to your glory, for those who use their time and their ability to prepare and assist our worship, for those who preside at worship and preach the gospel, for, for singers, for musicians, for those who prepare your house each week, for talent with flowers, banners, and with all the hearts, we thank you, O oh Lord. Lord, you bless those who acquired these new you bless those who acquired these new pyramids with the ability to work together in unity and joy. You move the hearts of our members to give generously back to you. Their stewardship of time, talents, and treasures is a rich blessing to us. For those who labored faithfully and gave freely, you gave us the beauty of liturgy for worship. As you walk with us on our annual pilgrimage through the Christian year, guide us with the changing colors of the pyramids. For Christian art, which proclaims the wonder of Christ for the benefit of fellow believers and for the strengthening of faith, Lord, we confess that we do not always put our hearts and minds into worship. Forgive our sins of approaching you too casually, carelessly, infrequently, or with indifference. Send your Holy Spirit so that everything we see, hear, and do in this place enriches us and in an offering to you. We dedicate these pyramids to your glory, O Lord, and for the benefit of your holy people. And God, we also pray that you look after us as a congregation, as a body of believers who gather in your name, not just to praise and to worship, but who seek to walk in ways that mirror your image in the world. We pray, O God, for the ministries of this place, that everything that we we do be done in such a way so that people see your love, your care. O God, help us to see your spirit. See your spirit that operates inside of this place. See your spirit that operates in the world. And then grant to us courage and boldness to go and do likewise. Grant to us, O God, discernment, discernment for direction, direction for now, direction for the future. O God, as we worship, we also are mindful of the world around us, here in our local community, but also in the world, around the globe. O God, what is needed, maybe more than any other time, is people to model what it's like to be in relationship with you. 
not done from a sense of arrogance, but that offer Christ, that are living examples of forgiveness, living examples of people who walk in faith. Use us, O God, we pray. We want to be used by you to be your servants. O Lord, as we worship, we're mindful of all those who have worshiped in this place before us for how they've led, how they've lived, and we give thanks. With them and with everybody who bears the name of Christ, we pray the prayer that you taught all of your followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Many of you know that... Uh, really for the last year or so, maybe even longer than that, uh, part of what we've been doing as a church is uh, we, we, we've had meetings to determine the direction of our church, what that might look like for us when it comes building-wise. And, and Will Clyatt is one of the co-chairs of our building committee, and we've asked Will to come and uh, give us a brief update of, of uh, some of the things that the committee's been doing over these last few months. Um, last October, Shane asked, or Shane asked if I would be a member of the building committee. And so the building committee kind of kicked off last October. Before that, there were some plans that, through a strategic plan, the church had looked at what the needs were for St. Paul. And, and there was an idea there um, that was in place that Will Barnes had helped um, some preliminary design work. When the building committee got together, we, we looked over that. We looked at what other needs the church may have. And we came to the church, the congregation, in January, I guess, and had a series of meetings with the different user groups and hopefully anybody and everybody that, that had an opinion that wanted to had a, a, some sort of say um, expressed that opinion. And from those meetings, it confirmed most of what we had, had thought. Youth, family ministries, is is the main need in this church um, we also need parking we need storage um, there's there's health and safety issues that need to be addressed um, and there's some needs in the existing building so through with will and with a, a program manager that that we've hired we went into the community and asked for um, RFP for contractors to, to tell us what they thought, you know, and if they would be interested in, in helping us move forward with St. Paul. Um, we identified six that we were interested in. Five of them gave us some really good proposals. Um, and, and we interviewed in, in July those five contractors. We selected, we wound up selecting Thayer Bray Construction to do the job. Um, Philip Thayer, who many of y'all know is a member here, gave us a really, I mean, it was a really impassioned talk on why he wanted the job. And, and, and we think Philip will do a, a fine job. Um, moving forward, we're, we're in the design, the more concrete design plan right now and, and budgeting. 
So in the next few months, you'll start seeing some signs around the church, um, letting y'all know what we're doing. But we really wanted to let, let you know where we have been since last October. There have been a lot of meetings, and we've probably worn out the building committee meeting and get ready because we're going to have more. Um, and, and I just ask for y'all to continue to pray for the building committee, pray for St. Paul, pray for the future of this church. Thank you. is Lord and Father of mankind. Please stand as you are able and join in the singing of hymn number 358. with his tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, as we worship today, may we be ever aware that all we have is a gift from you. And with that in mind, may we give generously and joyfully for your glory. Amen.
reading of scripture. Our scripture today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Some people who were there at the time told Jesus about certain Galileans. Pilate had mixed their blood with their sacrifices. Jesus said, These people from Galilee suffered greatly. Do you think they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? I tell you, no. But unless you turn away from your sins, you will die also. Or what about the 18 people in Siloam? They died when the tower fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you turn away from your sins, you will die too. Then Jesus told a story. A man had a fig tree, he said. It was growing in his vineyard. He went to look for fruit on it, and he didn't find any. So he went to the man who took care of the vineyard, and he said, For three years now I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, but I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for another year. I'll dig around it and feed it, and if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then I will cut it down. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. We welcome you again to worship. We would love for you to register your attendance. It's important for us to know that you're here. Also, if the, when the children, as the children come forward for the children's moment, please pass the peace of Christ with one another. Remember, uh, last week, I showed y'all a picture of the gold medals. Yeah. Have y'all been watching the Olympics? Uh, yeah. yeah. You, so you've been watching a lot of swimming, maybe some cycling, stuff like that. Anything else you've been watching? Volleyball? Yeah, volleyball. Did you watch yeah, soccer? I have a picture of the gold medals. Well, I don't have any pictures. There's so many gold medalists. I didn't have a picture of all of them. But they got, a, they got a gold medal just like this. One side has this on it, and one side has that on it. And you see? This is the front side, that's the back side. But I found some other things out about the Olympics. I've been glued to the TV all week watching the Olympics. Somebody watched the Olympics with me, didn't they? Ah. Yes, that's right, y'all did, didn't you? Yeah, I saw you. Well, you know, there's some things about the Olympics that I thought was really interesting. How many uh, athletes you think are there? 150? Well, just a little bit more. I'm thinking. I'm going to say thousands. It's actually over 10,000 athletes there. Can you believe that? And uh, how many countries do you think are there? Hmm. I'm going to take a guess. The whole world. The whole world? Yeah, the whole world. Well, how many do you think that would be? That's a pretty good guess. 400. Uh, 400? 100. Well, close. It's a little bit more than that. It's actually more than 200 countries. Uh, how, how many tickets do you think they've sold to go to the Olympics? Oh, Did y'all get any tickets? No. I didn't either, I tell you, you know. Uh, there are over a million, there's over a million tickets sold. How many people do you think were watching the Olympics? Oh, uh, thousands. Thousands? Really more. How many do you think that is? 5,000. 5, close. It's just a little bit more than that. It's, how about, how about? Not even close, actually. Actually, a little bit more than a billion. It's billions. Well, almost not quite infinity, but it's a lot. I'll tell you that many. Ten, well, a little bit more than that. There's, a, there's billions of people. I know it. There's billions of people watching the Olympics. Ten, ten hundred and three. Yeah, well, now listen. Yeah, t more than ten hundred and three, I tell you. 
But what we have is you got these athletes that are in the stadium or they're on the beach or whatever they're at, maybe in the pool, and they're people that are watching. And then there are people who are in Brazil who are, who are there and watching. But then there are people all the way around the world who are watching. And there's a, uh, it reminded, when I was watching the Olympics, it made me think about something that shows up in the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews says that pe- we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And so even though they're athletes playing on the ground, there are people all around that are cheering them on. And of course, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, is talking about us and life, that there are people all the way around you watching you and encouraging you in your life with God. Can you believe that? Just like we're watching the Olympics, people are watching you. That's exciting, isn't it? Probably not as much as the... Your parents watch you all the time. You're probably not as excited as your parents, right? So, well, I'll tell you what, let's, I want to say a prayer of thanks that there are people who surround us and who encourage us. Sometimes our parents, sometimes even more than that. You ready? All right, let's close our eyes. Oh, God, we give thanks today for your love and your mercy. We give thanks uh, that, that around us are a great cloud of witnesses. And it has this uh, image of being in a stadium and that there are people playing on the field and yet there are people in the stands who are encouraging who, who are caring, who are loving, and we're grateful that there are people who do that for us. Uh, so as we watch the Olympics and watch other games, help us to be mindful of the larger picture and all the wonderful things that you're doing in our life. Bless these who sit with me. Watch over them, O oh God. Bless their families. Keep them safe. And we pray it in the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs> Bye-bye.
I'm not quite sure who gets more points today, a full left side or the two that faithfully held up the right side. You know, that, that saying, when the cat's away, the mice will play. You know, Wayne and Jenny go on vacation, and out we go, right? So, uh, My watch stopped about 10 minutes ago, so if you'll set yours back 10 minutes, we'll end right at noon. Join me in prayer. Oh, God, as we now, uh, we want the text to become the gospel and to bury itself deep down into our souls, and so we pray for that again. We know that that cannot happen without your Holy Spirit, and we're grateful for that, uh, that you have this wonderful ability to, to weave into sounds, and from that it can become thoughts, and then from thoughts it can lead to identity, and from identity it can lead to actions and behaviors. And all of that, oh God, we trust in you. And so we pray this now in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, I do need to tell you, it pains me to admit this, but um, I am, even on my best day, nothing more than an average golfer. And it's taken me a lot to work through that, but I've come to that conclusion. And the other day, I was playing golf with some friends of mine, and we were standing on the ninth hole of this course that we were playing at, and, and the ninth hole is straight up a hill, and, and I hit my tee shot, and I, you know, at, at first it started out pretty good, and, and then it just started leaking to the right, and on the right side of the ninth hole were all these trees, and so I was just watching the trajectory, and it was just a matter of time before it would leak over into the woods, and then I would be in trouble. And somewhere along the ways, it hit something and not just bounced back in the fairway, but bounced back in the fairway going forward. And one of the guys that we were playing with, he, he looked at me and he said, yeah, that about sums it up. Here he is, the preacher. You know, this is what happens when you're living right, correct? You know, and so I just kind of shrugged my shoulders. Two holes later, we're on hole number 11, and I hit my drive down. This time the, the, the hole is downhill, and and I'm in the middle of the fairway, and I've got a little sand wedge for me into the green. And I hit this shot that I think is fantastic. So much so that I'm just holding, you know, like you do on TV, the pros. And I'm watching the ball. You know, it's lined up directly with the pin. And, and I think it's just going to land there and, you know, at best stop or maybe go forward for a second and then sort of come back a little bit. And, you know, I think it's kicking birdie. And so I'm all excited watching it in the air. And then it hits on the green. And normally this green is, is fairly soft. But the ball sounded just like this. And immediately it kicked up and kicked into the woods. And, uh, and the guy, another guy that was standing next to me said, oh, that's a tough break because that was a really good shot. And this probably tells you why I'm an average golfer. The rest of the round, I was thinking about those two statements and not the remaining holes. Because that seems to be how we sum up and relate uh, to the world around us, at least when it comes to how, how things should work, when it comes to the world, when it comes to, to God, when it comes to people, when it comes to suffering and, and tragedy, we, we think they're all sort of connected that way, where that if you, at least when it comes to good things with good results and bad things and bad results. You know, we think that if you are good and you do good, then you should get good things. But if you are bad and you do bad, then the results should be bad. And, and God behind it all is orchestrating all of this in some form or fashion in this basic form of what I would call cause and effect theology. That it's all related that way. That's the story behind the story in the text this morning. Now, there's a couple things that we need to know about the original audience. There were two events that took place uh, around this time that the original audience were definitely well aware of. And there, one of them was there was this group of Galileans. They're, they're on their way down south. Galilee is in the north, and they're coming down south to the temple. And, and probably as an act of vengeance, Pilate allows them to come into the temple. But the moment they're in the temple getting ready to, to sacrifice, Pilate sends his guards in, and they murder the Galileans. And then they take the blood of the Galileans, and they mix it into the blood uh, of the animals that were being offered as a sacrifice. Pilate's basically, he's murdered these people, and he's basically, you know, insult into injury. Uh, and on top of that, there was a group of people, 18, 
that were at one of the corners of Jerusalem. Jerusalem had a wall that went around it, and whenever uh, at, at one of the edges, it would make basically the equivalent of like a 90-degree turn, and there would be a tower there. One of those towers was right on the other side of the Pool of Siloam. And at some point, we don't know when, but there were, both, you know, there were a multitude of people that would always be around the Pool of Siloam. You might remember a larger story in the Gospels where there were a number of folks that are, that are paralyzed and they're waiting for the water to ripple. And then as soon as it rippled, and they would try to get into the pool first because normally the person who got into the pool would, would somehow experience some level of healing. And so there were people all the way around the pool where at some point in time, the tower failed. And it ended up uh, crushing 18 people. Those are the two events. And so the people have related those events with this cause and effect type understanding of how the world works. More specifically, the thought was that bad things happened to them, those Galileans, and those 18 people by the pool because either they, they did something bad or sinful or someone related to them, and they're getting their just reward. That's the context of the scripture lesson. And this, this, this level of thought, this theological thought, actually predates Jesus. You can go way back into the very beginnings of the Old Testament in the, what we call the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. And, and there was a, a, a teaching that came out that, that suffering or bad things, for lack of better words, that that in some form or fashion was the result of, of previous bad actions. And so whenever someone experienced tragedy, when they experienced suffering, when they experienced bad things, it was the result of them doing bad things previously. Now, you need to understand what's going on in the Old Testament, uh, particularly in the, in the Torah, the first five books. You've got a people, a group of people, the children of Israel, they're coming out of Egypt. They're in, they're in the wilderness for a period of time. They're getting ready to go into what we call the promised lands. And so there are all kinds of teachings, all types of warnings, commandments that are given to help them to, to find their way in this new place that is going to be filled with all types of freedom. They're leaving when they, when, at, on the mountain. They, uh, God uh, says, you're my people. I'm going to give you some help. I'm going to give you some foul lines. I'm going to give you some commandments. I'm going to give you some teachings. They, they get talked about in, in terms of blessings and cursings. And, and what we want you to do is, is you, you stay inside those and things are going to be okay. Not unlike what some of you have done this week when you dropped off either your sons or your daughters or your grandsons or your granddaughters at college. Now, you might not have called it blessings and cursings, but what was the teaching? Don't forget who you are. Remember your identity. You're going into a place now that has all that you don't know. It's new. There's all types of freedoms. They're going to have all types of experiences. You're going to be living inside of this area. We want you to have a good time. We want you to study. And you, if you do X, then that's going to be what happens. But if you do Y, then that's going to happen. Same concept. In the Old Testament, uh, God through people, God, God uh, through, through the voice of Moses, through other people, we're, we're, giving, uh, we're giving foul lines, we're giving commandments, we're, we're giving direction for them. Don't lose your sense of identity. But when you go into this new place, it's completely foreign to you. You're going to be here. You're going to be living here. But just live differently. Well, some of you know the rest of the Old Testament and the children of Israel, they lost their way. They did things that they weren't supposed to do. And they got in all types of trouble. They show up in terms of, of captivities. There's a northern captivity. There's a southern captivity. And, and, the, and the prophets and the reformers who come after the prophets, they have the same teaching. They say, we got here because we did things wrong, cause and effect. If we're going to get out of this place, we've got to stop doing what's wrong and we've got to go and do what is right because after all, if you are good and you do good things, you do right things and you're going to get a right reward. That's the context. And the people then also develop something from this whole level of thought that is very, very dangerous. 
Because what developed coming out of this Old Testament teaching, and it showed up in, in the later parts of the Old Testament, but it definitely shows up in the times of Jesus, is this twisted understanding of self-righteousness that says, I'm currently not experiencing tragedy or bad things, so I must be good, but everybody else who's experiencing bad things, well, they're bad. And so they saw people that way. They saw themselves not as sinners, because after all, do you remember the conversation that the disciples have with Jesus in John chapter 9 where they're walking down the road? And keep in mind, this is the disciples. This is not just anybody. And they see a person who's blind, and they look over, and their first questions are, whose sin caused this, his or his parents? because he must be living in some form of punishment because he's blind. And God, you know, after all, it's cause and effect. Somebody must have done something wrong, and now they're reaping the reward that should be theirs. You remember that parable? Same question the people are asking in the text. Jesus, which, who sinned? The Galileans? Their parents, the 18 by the people, you know, the 18 people by the pool, obviously they're bad people because they're getting their just reward. Self-righteousness. Bernard of Clairvaux, in reflecting on these passages, wrote this, as while we should be cautious of holding too low an opinion of ourselves, we should be even more afraid of thinking we are better than what we are. It is dangerous to presume that any good in us is the result of our own efforts we become arrogant not only do we fail to give God the credit due him we actually can come to despising I would add to despise other people as well if we think that because we our life currently has the absence of either tragedy or suffering or bad things that we then deduce back that the reason we are living in this state is because we are do it. Be careful. Self-righteousness. Yeah, you know, this person over here, oh, Shane, you know, he's a bad sinner. He gets what he, you know. That's him not me. That can begin a process where we spiral down to where it becomes very toxic. And what we then begin to do is uh, we begin to look down on other people. We spend more time in comparison. We spend more time in judgment of others, always giving ourselves the free pass, which means we have a hard time with forgiveness accepting it granting it because if we're the good ones and they're the sinners then there's no need for grace for us Jesus shocked his audience with what he does they come to him with these questions and they say uh, you know, they're, they're, the, they're, they're the horrible sinners, right, Jesus? And Jesus broadens the conversation to a much larger picture for two reasons. One, life can't be reduced to just simple cause and effect. How many times have you pushed your drive on hole number nine and it hits a tree and it lands in the fairway? Or you hit a beautiful sand wedge and it goes in the woods. To say it differently, how many times have you done something that was good and didn't get a good reward? Or then do something that was bad and yet got something you didn't deserve? Our experience in life alone 
illustrates that it's not cause and effect in absolute terms. But we have to be careful because it's so easy to want that. Jesus goes on, when they ask the question, he, he, he asks the question back to, to his audience. He, he says, uh, is that why they suffered? Those 18 people, natural disaster. Did they suffer because they're sinful? How about the Galileans who were murdered? Was their suffering because they were worse sinners? This is what he says, worse sinners than you? You know, to begin to think that, the idea that says, I'm good, I do good things, and so God then needs to reward me because I'm doing good, actually reduces God to nothing more than just a means to an end. And we belittle the journey of God in the face of Christ that embraces a crucifixion and a resurrection. But it's easy to do. Jesus goes on to two times in verses 3 and in verse 5 where they're talking about who, what's the cause? Who sinned? And his answer is, well, if you want to have that conversation, then it's all of ours. All of ours. Are we, to use Jesus' language, any worse or any better than someone else, at least when it comes to being compared to God? See, we like comparison when it works our way. I like comparison people that I know have made mistakes, particularly the mistakes I haven't made, because that makes me feel better. You see it in the text? And Jesus says, well, if you're going to compare, you need to compare yourself to me. Because if God was in the business of assigning out judgment or curses in relation to sin, frankly, there would be no one left on the planet. But we like cause and effect. Because cause and effect gives us this sense of self-righteousness. And Jesus is trying to get his audience, and I would argue even us, to see that all of us have benefited ways that we didn't deserve. It doesn't matter how good we've been, how many good things that we're doing even at this very moment. There isn't any one of us inside of this sanctuary that hasn't benefited by the hands of other people and the hands of God. Our life has been a windfall. That's not cause and effect. People have cared for us, cared for you, loved you, loved us when we didn't deserve it. And yet they did it as a gift. And it goes on to tell this story about this fig tree. For three years, the owner of the vineyard has watched this fig tree and for three years, it did not do what it should have. And the owner wants to cut it down. And yet there's this gardener. And this gardener goes and pleads with the owner of the vineyard and says, don't do that just yet. I know what the fig tree should deserve. It hasn't produced. It needs to be cut down. It needs to be turned into mulch. Just don't do that yet. Let me care for it. Let me love it. Let me give it fertilizer. Let me water it. Let me make sure it gets the right amount of sun. Not too much, not too less. Just hold off on giving it what it deserves. Who's the fig tree in the parable? It's us. 
don't miss the gospel lesson. It's not always cause and effect. We have benefited our entire life long, and it's a gift. A gift from God. The truth is of God, well, I'll I'll speak first person. I like cause and effect. Because in some twisted way, I feel like I'm in the driver's seat. And I can dictate the terms. And that has a way of of altering my vision to where I see the I see the facts around me through my own terms. Which then means I can justify my own actions. And God, if I can justify my own actions, then in some form or fashion, I feel like I can mandate things from you. I know I'm not alone, so forgive us. broaden back the clouds before us separate them and help us to see even if it is in just a glimpse of all the ways we have received what we didn't deserve in life breath love faith wholeness, salvation, forgiveness. They're gifts that you give us. Oh God, help us not to miss that. This we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand as you're able. Our hymn of consecration, you'll find it. It's hymn number 580. Lead on, O King Eternal. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing the first and the last of hymn number 580.